What's up friends, it's Josh. And if you stick around till the end of this video, I'm gonna show you how to save $750 on your next mountain bike. As we all know, mountain biking is not cheap. I wouldn't be surprised if your current mountain bike costs more than your first car did. I know mine does, and that's with implementing some of these techniques that I've used to save money on it. But today I'm gonna show you four areas where I think you can save a lot of money, whether you're buying a complete bike or building up a custom bike from parts. At the end of the video, I'll also share with you four areas where I really recommend that you spend basically as much as your budget allows to get the right part for you. So without further ado, let's jump into it with the first place I think you can save money and that's in your suspension. Now, I don't have my bike with me right now, but if you've seen my other videos, you probably think that I run a RockShox Lyric Ultimate Fork, but I actually have just the Lyric Select with some custom graphics on it. And by choosing the Select instead of the Ultimate, I saved about $250 on my fork alone. And to be honest, the only real difference there is between the two is just some extra compression dampening adjustment. Now, most riders you meet are gonna tell you that, yeah, you should get the Fox Factory or the RockShock Ultimate line and get all those bells and whistles. But I wouldn't be surprised if a majority of those people couldn't even tell you the difference between a few clicks of high speed or low speed compression. In addition to the extra compression adjustment, there's a few other things that delineate between the RockShock Select and RockShock Ultimate or the Fox Performance and the Fox Factory. But other than that, they're pretty dang similar. And it gets even more similar when you look at rear shocks. I ride a hardtail, so that's a place that I don't need to worry about expense in general. But looking at top tier and more kind of mid-level rear shocks on bikes, they're almost identical. Take for instance, the Fox Float DPS. It's probably one of the most popular shocks on the market. The performance level, which is their more kind of mid-range or even entry level model, costs $330. That's $150 less than their top tier DPS factory, which as far as I can tell, literally the only difference is one extra click of compression adjustment and then Fox's Kashima coating, which I still think is all just a hoax to get you to pay more money on your bike parts, but that's for a different video. Other than that, the two shocks are the exact same. They have the same air spring, they weigh the same amount, they're identical. So by choosing a slightly lower tier fork and shock for your bike, you've already saved yourself $500, and I guarantee you that's not gonna make any difference on 99% of your rides. The next place where you can save quite a bit of money is on your seat post. Now, before you freak out and think I'm gonna tell you to just buy a quick release clamp and a rigid seat post, don't worry, I'm not. I actually tell people that dropper seat posts are the only reason I ride mountain bikes. So I'm all about the dropper seat post. But as with the suspension, there's quite a big range in price. And I don't think that price fully makes up for the performance difference. The value dropper seat post that I'm gonna talk about today is the P&W Rainier post. This is a pretty rad post. It's available in a ton of different travel sizes. And the coolest thing about it is that it's travel, it's amount of drop is actually adjustable. Why would you want this? Well, if you plan to use that seat post on multiple bikes, that'll be super helpful. It'll also come in handy if more than one rider is gonna be riding that bike. They can just shim the seat post to where they want, and then it'll always go up to where they need it to be for their leg length, instead of having to kind of sit down and lower it down just a little bit. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Fox Transfer Factory Post, which is $359. That's a whole $170 more. So what does that money get you? To be honest, not a ton. Once again, you get the Kashima coating. Uh, essentially, Fox says that that reduces the amount of friction. The post is also a little bit lighter. And to me, probably the most important difference is the difference in stack height and overall length. Those are kind of more technical terms that I'm not gonna get into here, but basically it'll allow more people to run a longer seat post. In other words, one with more travel, regardless of their leg length or the seat tube length on their bike. But in my personal opinion, I'd much rather have that ability to adjust the overall travel of the seat post, uh, regardless of price. So I actually think the PW post is the better post period, not just based on value. The third area that I'd recommend saving a little bit of extra money on your next bike or your next build is on the pedals. I'm a huge fan of composite pedals. Composite pedals are basically just like fancy plastic. Usually they have metal pins. Don't get any composite pedals that don't have metal pins in it. 
I've been running composite pedals for years. I rode them on BMX bikes long before they were even popular for mountain biking. And I've never had an issue with them. They're lighter than their, you know, aluminum or magnesium counterpart. And they have 99% as much grip as an aluminum pedal does. Now the value or budget pedal that I'm gonna talk about right now is the One Up Components composite pedal. And that's just $39.50. That's a whole $100 cheaper than 1UP's aluminum pedal. Now, of course, there are differences. The aluminum pedal uses better bearings. So in theory, the pedal will last longer. You won't need to service it as often. It's also gonna have a little bit better grip. But to me, I'd rather have the cheaper pedal. It's also lighter, about 30 grams lighter if you're super interested in weight. I would choose the composite pedal over the aluminum any day. Now, I realize that's a little controversial. A lot of people swear by aluminum pedals my wife being one of them, she just loves the extra grip that you get. So take that with a grain of salt, maybe try both types. But for me, I'm gonna take my extra $100 and run those composite pedals. Now, speaking of controversial, the fourth area that I recommend you pinching pennies and saving a little bit of money is actually on your tires. That's right, I'm saying that I don't think you should go out there and spend close to $100 on one Maxxis tire. And before you yell at me and call me crazy, I've been there. I rode Maxxis DHF in the front and Aggressor in the back for like two or three years, and they're absolutely amazing tires. I didn't think I'd ever switch off of Maxxis until I got a free set of tires after finishing up a season at Snow Summit Bike Park. My tires were shot, I needed something new, I was a little short on money, and the shop said, hey, we've got these extra Bontrager XR4 tires. And I thought they were gonna suck, but I knew that they'd at least get me through a couple months and I could go get my Maxxises again. But I've been running those tires now for two or three months and they've been awesome. They're lighter than the Maxxis. I still haven't had a single flat in them and the grip is not quite as good, but it's still predictable enough that they haven't really bothered me. But the value tire that I'm gonna use for this comparison comes from a relatively new brand called Delium and they're all about making value oriented tires. I personally haven't ridden one yet, but from what I've seen from Pink Bike and other reviewers, they seem to be pretty dang good. And looking at the tread pattern between this Delium Rugged and the Maxxis DHF, what I used to ride, they look pretty dang similar as well. Now this Delium Rugged will set you back $48. That is literally half the price of the equivalent Maxxis DHF. So I could get a whole tire set for the cost of one Maxxis tire. Again, I haven't personally ridden these tires, but I would have no issue going to a shop or buying these online. They seem like a pretty good option. So there you have it. Four areas that I would recommend saving a little bit of extra money on your mountain bike. If you take the total of the high-end kind of factory level parts, as well as the more budget or value-minded, that'll save you a whole $750. And that's a lot of money. I would much rather go and take that and spend it on a, I don't know, season pass to a bike park or a dream mountain bike trip you've been wanting to do than just on bike parts that might give you a one or 2% increase in performance. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, I also wanna touch on four areas that I wouldn't recommend trying to skimp on. In fact, I'd even say you could take some of that $750 you spent on your suspension or tires and invest it into these. The first item on this list is your frame. Your frame is like the skeleton of your bike. It's probably the part that you'll have the longest as you're swapping on and off different parts to that frame. So I would just recommend getting a frame that's gonna work well for you from the get-go. The second area that I would invest as much as you're able to is your wheels. Your wheel is what's called rolling or unsprung weight. And due to some fancy physics stuff, you're gonna notice that weight a lot more than anything else that's fixed to your frame. In addition to that, I'm particularly picky about hub engagement. That's essentially how much slack or free play there is in your cassette. I hate that when you step on the pedals and there's that like 10 or 20 degree little gap before you actually make engagement with the hub. So I always try to find the highest engagement hub that I can afford. And when you start doing tricks like wheelies or something like that down the road, you'll find that having a higher engagement hub actually makes that a lot easier. The third area that I recommend you not trying to save money on is your drivetrain. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go out there and get like, I don't know, SRAM Axis or something like that, but I also don't think you should try to pinch pennies here. If you really wanna save some extra money, then you can be crazy like I just did and convert your bike to a single speed. If that's something that you're curious about, I just made a video about how and why I converted my bike to a single speed. So you can check that video out when you're done watching this one. The fourth and final area that I'd recommend investing a little bit of extra money into is on your saddle. 
You're sitting in that seat all day long. You might as well pay the money to get something that's gonna be comfortable and just make riding your bike that much more enjoyable. So hopefully that provides a kind of clear way for you if you're about to buy another bike or you want to upgrade your own of how you can save a little bit of extra money along the way. If you're interested to learn more about my personal bike and the parts that I ride on it as a more budget oriented rider, I've actually done a whole bike check and review on my RSD middle child. I absolutely love that bike. And you can go ahead and check that video out here. Once you're done watching that video, make sure you go get on your bike, go out for a ride, and hopefully we'll see you on the trail.